Good afternoon and welcome to the Zero Project Conference 2022. This is a fireside chat and my host this afternoon is Janice Linz. She is CEO of Hearing Access and Innovations and an activist. Good afternoon or good morning to you, Janice. Hi, good morning. Yes, it's real. It's very, it's early. Not as early as it was for the last presentation, <laughs> but it's early. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes, you already joined us for, for an early session. Thank you for your time. You're East Coast based and this is a more, more civil hour. Um, Janice, a brief introduction of yourself before we talk about your, your activities, please. I am the CEO of um, Hearing Access and Innovations, and thank you for having me, and, and I really appreciate it. I'm also the mother of a daughter with a hearing loss, which is how I found myself in advocacy for people with hearing loss. And what does Hearing Access and Innovations do? So we work with companies, countries, um, government agencies, to help them become accessible for people with hearing loss. And what is, what is what people with hearing loss need? What is effective communication for them? So effective communication is what I call a three prong approach. It's visual, turning sound into readable words, audio, bringing the sound directly to a person's hearing aid or cochlear implant, um, when the sound jumps from the microphone electromagnetically to the person's hearing aids or cochlear implant when they switch to the T telecoil setting. And, and, then thir and then the third is sign language. So you need all three things to have effective communication to reach the full spectrum of people with hearing loss, which ranges from mild to deaf. And there's a lot of gray in between because People don't just fit into neat boxes. There's a lot of overlap between the categories. Janice, you are an activist, a quite experienced one, but what is the essence of working together? Why is it so important? Well, if you saw my presentation earlier, you would see I had a tremendous amount of slides and photos from around the world. Well, while I travel extensively and I've been to 195 countries, territories, and unrecognized nations, I count and hope for people to send me slides showing the access in their countries. And what that does is it allows me to then use that access to gain access either in my home country, the United States, or in other countries. So for example, right now I'm trying to bring induction loops which I just described, to ferries in the United States. And, and the way I'm doing it is I worked with people in Canada and Norway and Australia where they had the access. I used those photos to create federal comments for the United States and show that when a ferry company says they can't do it, that's a falsehood. And... It is done in other ferries, and thanks to um, Prime Minister Trudeau, I had the CAD drawings from the British Columbia ships, and thanks to the Norwegian Department of Transportation, I had the contracts from Norway. That is invaluable, and I'm still at the more nascent stage on that project, but as I mentioned earlier, Ram, um, Amtrak is adding induction loops to their rail cars. That was feasible because I was on the U.S. Access Board's Federal Rail Committee, and I was able to show the, the access on trains in the U.K., again in Australia. And when I had those photos, it made it a no-brainer. No they couldn't say no because they couldn't say it didn't work. Here it was. It wasn't like, can it work. It was like, why isn't it in the United States? So to me, that is working together. And then what I accomplished in the U.S., I work with other countries to help them as well. And to me, that is the very essence of how we're going to affect change by working together. Janice, how can we raise the bar when it comes to assistive technology? I think this is a common uh, thread we're all facing. Uh, how can we do that? 
Well, for me, this is a big issue and something that I have really um, taken the World Hearing Organization to task for. Because the problem is, you know, for the WHO, you have 193 member nations plus two observer states. There's a significant number of developing nations that the people in their countries don't have hearing aids because they, the hearing aids were unaffordable. I've worked, and I'm the person behind me in the United States, making hearing aids more affordable with the over-the-care uh, um, proposed hearing re regulations. But you can't just go to one, the same way we can't just provide access for one part of the spectrum of hearing loss, we can't just provide access for one part of the economic spectrum. We have to provide the whole economic spectrum, the whole spectrum of people with hearing loss. Because if you always do it to the lowest common denominator, you're never going to progress. And that's just ridiculous. And we're never going to advance access. So we really need the WHO to raise the bar because they are really, in my opinion, not including induction loops because a lot of countries can't afford it. Well, there's a lot of countries that can't afford it. Or, and, and we need to include that. And so, again, it's we have to include the entire economic spectrum globally. And then we help the countries who are not in a position to offer it to move towards that place. Janice, uh, Zero Project stands for Zero bar Barriers. Uh, what, in your opinion, are the biggest obstacles, the biggest barriers people with hearing loss are facing at the moment? Well, this is not going to be such a nice, pretty thing to say, but I think one of the biggest problems is we have people without hearing loss making decisions for people with hearing loss. And all too often, I see the access directors in various um, positions, uh, the access coordinators use vis have visible disabilities because when a company wants to hire someone, they want everyone to know that they have a, a disability and they're looking for someone with a visible disability versus an invisible disability and hearing loss is an invisible disability unless you're deaf and you can see the sign language interpreter like you can in the corner. But when you have someone who is using a wheelchair or is blind or deaf making a decision about whether or not people who are hard of hearing need induction loops, that's inappropriate. That would like be like me making decisions about a different race than my own, which would be really inappropriate, or another race making decisions about my race. And when we turn some of these complicated discussions into a race base, the, it's more obvious why it's wrong. But for far too long, people with hearing loss have been beholden to people using wheelchairs for making decisions about them. Then we also come into another place where people with visual impairments don't like induction loops because they want audio description and induction loops um, can't provide that. But people with hearing loss shouldn't have to wear an additional receiver because a person with a visual impairment isn't wearing a hearing aid or cochlear implant. As I always say for in the U.S., the Americans with Disabilities Act doesn't have a buy one, get one disability free. If people with visual impairments need another system to have audio description, then they should have that. But people with hearing loss shouldn't have to wear a device which they feel is stigmatizing because people with visual impairments need audio description. And that then brings in the problem where when people who are hard of hearing don't want to wear a device around their neck and they say it's stigmatizing, then you have disabilities who have visible disabilities saying, well, we have a visible disability and we can't hide. Why do we care whether or not you have to wear a stigmatizing device? And so what it does is it places a real um, tension between the various disabilities because people outside the disability world seem to think that one disability can make a decision about another disability. And then finally, the third issue is the perception is if you have a disability, 
you are an expert about the disability. That's not true either. Just because you put hearing aids into your ears doesn't make you a disability expert any more than I have a cell phone and I'm not an expert about my cell phone. And I have been to way too many um, meetings with people with disabilities who are access coordinators and they have no idea about access coordination. They have no idea about their disability. And, and, and these are the decision makers and it's terrifying. If you would hire a professional to let's say decorate your apartment, that's what you need to hire as a professional, but not just someone who has the disability. It most definitely should be not about us without us, but it has to be a knowledgeable, not about us without us person. Not let's just say relying on anyone who just wears a, a hearing aid. Janice, there is a proposed OTC hearing regulation uh, coming. What do you expect from it? Well, I'm very excited because I'm the person who drove this. Um, when I went to Senator Warren trying to figure out how we could disrupt the hearing aid oligopoly because hearing aid should not be the new status symbol for the rich. And the new proposed regulations are based on my testimony before the FDA. And I'm thrilled by that. Of course, I have more things I want. So um, while they are going to be doing testing and, and the FDA says that they're going to in the future um, create generic names for features, we need that sooner than later because it's hard to test features if you don't have the generic names to make one hearing aid comparable to the other. And there is no data and there's no way to compare one hearing aid to the other hearing aid. And so people with hearing loss are dependent upon audiologists or hearing aid dispensers who have an inherent conflict of interest in many places, but definitely in the U.S., because they are both prescribing and selling the hearing aids. And they don't sell every hearing aid and they don't carry every product hearing aid company or even every hearing aid within a product line. And yet people with hearing loss are relying on them. And you know, there's an old saying, you know, you're not gonna, Macy's is not gonna send you to gimbals. I'm dating myself, but you're not gonna, if you're an audiologist and it takes on average seven years to get someone to purchase a hearing aid from the time they think they need a hearing aid, you're not going to go send your client to a competitor to go get a hearing aid because you don't carry it. And so what that does is you have people saying maybe a hearing aid doesn't work for you. You're maxed out recommending cochlear implants when in fact you may not need a cochlear implant. You just need a hearing aid that works. But if you don't have the data where you can help make those decisions and the person telling you about the hearing aid doesn't have the data you could be having some very serious surgery. Now, cochlear implants are, are critical for people who need them, but we wanna make sure that the people getting cochlear implants need them and that people have all the information they need when they're purchasing a hearing aid because they're super expensive. Now, even this, I did this based on my personal experience. We had an audiologist tell my daughter she needed a cochlear implant. It turned out there was a hearing aid that was available and the audiologist didn't know about it. That is just unacceptable. Now, I see where there are certain problems where in Europe, I know some countries are, people in Europe are afraid that the United States ruling is gonna impact them because they have their hearing aids covered under their insurance, where in the United States, not so much. And we have to find a way to make that work so that we're not preventing the advancement of hearing aids and testing because of insurance issues between countries. That's not the answer of blocking advancement because of insurance issues between the two different countries and how um, hearing aids are covered. And I think that's more, let's focus on that issue, figure out how we can come up to a good solution, but let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Thank you, Jenny. I don't know if that it's, translates in all countries. <laughs> thank you. It's always good to talk to you. You're such an energizing person. Uh, thank you so much. We have here in the studio, we have uh, our friend Petra Plitschke, uh, who did some, some graphic facilitation, and uh, she's going to summarize our little conversation here. Petra, please. 
Yes, hello. Um, I try to get um, all this energizing information over here <laughs> to Vienna. Um, what we heard from you was uh, something very crucial. First of all, uh, make those people who are experts in their field experts. So having the knowledge on your disability is one thing, but you should also be a knowledgeable and a professional person. And these people should be involved when we talk about uh, creating products um, that are suiting for the hard, and hard of hearing or deaf people. And then we can go to companies and to countries, and you've been traveling all around the world to advocate for, um, for your mission. And what you do is you say you rely a lot on pictures that you get where like best practices happen. Um, so if a company or a country tells you, no, that's not possible, you can show them, well, yes, it is. We can do it. Um, it is possible to serve um, a good product and a good solution to people with who are hard of hearing or deaf. Um, you said there are three things um, that can help hard of hearing people to better understand. There's visual, so transform something to text. Um, then the audio signal being transferred to the T uh, through T-coil to a hearing aid or cochlea implant or um, sign language. And it's important to include all the spectrum from people who are hard of hearing up to the uh, point uh, if they're deaf. And there's also a spectrum when it comes to money, be it in countries or be it in companies. Um, and the last message I want to point out is that uh, at the end you said, to, that's how it sounded to me, you must fit the aid to the person. So you must, ha must have ex um, experienced professionals who are not trying to sell their product, but to find the best possible solution for the person who needs an aid or um, some, some support. So I think, I, I hope I got it right. <laughs> Thank you. You did, I love that. Oh my God, that is amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Janice, um, for your contributions uh, twice today. It's always good to talk to you and, uh, and have a good weekend. And uh, thank you for tuning in for the Zero Project Conference 2022. This was the last fireside chat. Uh, we will start the closing ceremony in the plenary in about five minutes. Thank you for watching us. Have a good day. <laughs>